Hello and welcome to Ishoda Hospital's Nursing Education and Training Facebook Live webinars every Thursday at 3 p.m. I'm Pratyusha Chaudhary hosting today's webinar on prone ventilation in critically ill patients. So thanks a lot for joining us for the uh, for taking your time uh, to join us for the today's webinar. And we promise you to provide you the super three benefits out of this webinar. Why ventilation, prone ventilation is important in the critically ill patients, indications, contraindications, outweighing the complications, and what would be the special considerations for prone ventilation. And we have also got the super three benefit, uh, super uh, surprising benefits that you're going to get out of this webinar at the end through the discussion through the expert panelist for the day. So, so further without, without any delay, so let me introduce you to the pros of today's uh, webinar. We have our expert panelist for the day, Dr. Vishweshwaran, who is the consultant interventional pulmonologist and sleep medicine at Eshoda Hospital Samaji Guda. We welcome, welcome you for the webinar, sir. And to dive deeper and to have a comprehensive talk about this, we have got our speak with the, speaker for the day, Ms. Gayatri. So she is our AGM nursing for Ishoda Hospitals at Somaji Gura. So over to you, uh, Gayatri. Thank you, Pratyusha. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be the important part of this webinar. So today we are going to have a brief and detailed discussion about uh, prone ventilation. So prone ventilation refers to delivery of mechanical ventilation with the patient lying in the prone position. When patient is in the prone position with the mechanical ventilation, we usually offer two types of mechanical ventilation modes to the patient. First one is volume control ventilation. Next was uh, one was uh, pressure controlled ventilation. In volume controlled ventilation, the word name itself denotes us the volume that we provide to the patient is uh, constant and the pressure offered varies according to the respiratory condition of the patient. But coming to the pressure controlled mode, the volume that you offer to the patient is not constant. It changes according to the patient's situations and scenarios. So there are many studies that were conducted uh, to exaggerate or to emphasize on the um, on this uh, prone positioning. One among that is PROCEVA trial in which it was conducted in the year 2013 on the bats. When it was conducted, the criteria for inclusion is patient who are having ARDS and who is having the PF ratio less than 150. Once this PROCEVA trial was conducted, there has been uh, so much of reduction in the mortality and hence it was proved and started in the human beings. So why you have to prone the patient and whom you have to prone the patient is there are particular indications. The first indication would be the bilateral basal lung collapse and the patients who are with acute respiratory distress syndrome and patients who also have acute lung injury. For this consideration can be the PF ratio should be always less than 150 and it also can be used for the patients who are having moderate to severe acute respiratory failure. This prone ventilation is a major indication for the patients who needs mobilization of secretions. But then this prone ventilation also cannot be utilized or used and on, under particular contraindications, they are like shock, patients who are having acute bleeding and pregnancy. Because of increased abdominal pressure in the prone position, this cannot be used when patient is on pregnancy. When patient is having poor previous uh, poor tolerance to this prone position and unstable spine fractures and patient who is having tracheostomy less than 24 hours. When tracheostomy tube is placed uh, very newly within 24 hours, prone position cannot be given because there is chance of mobilization of inner cannulas. And when patient is also having chest wall abnormalities, you cannot give prone position. 
so uh, how long can you place uh, or how long you can keep the patient in the prone position yes the prone there is no particular indication that patient should be in this much time and patient cannot be more than 24 hours more than 40 hours there is no such indication but then ideal timing or duration for this prone position is 16 to 18 hours so before you start a next session of proning a typically 4 hours of supination is usually given to the patients so there are many benefits why you have to prone the patient and why always uh, proning is considered over supination is that for the better ventilation in the picture it is very much evident that when patient is in the supine position the ventral alveolus were over distended and the dorsal alveoli were collapsed but when you see in the prone position in the picture it is shown the dorsal alveoli has decreased the collapse and the ventral alveoli has uh, decreased in its over distension because of this the alveoli will have the capacity of holding the oxygen air for the longer time and gaseous exchange will take place the first most uh, thing is for the better ventilation next one is improved lung perfusion because of the anatomy in the prone position or be reduced uh, heart pressure on the lungs and also reduced uh, vascular constriction what happens is there is increased blood supply to the lungs thus improving the lung perfusion next uh, the most uh, thing is drainage of secretions when there are secretions cooled in the lungs when you give a prone position to the patient the mobilization of secretions with the pressure gradient happen because of the prone position this is well explained by the sponge model for example if you consider you take a sponge dip it in the water and place it in the upright position what happens the water that is present on the top layers move to the bottom and thus all the water will be drained out of the sponge the same way when patient is in the prone position from the lower lobes all the secretions gets uh, moved to the upper lobes and thus they will be secreted outside next one is improvement in the mortality as we have discussed in the previous slide saying that uh, because of this procedure trial it is evident that there is improvement in the mortality of the patient when you have prone the patient so prior to proning there are few considerations that you have to look into because when you prone the patient there is always a chance that patient will develop pressure ulcers because the proning sessions are longer so for that you have to apply hydrocolloid dressings to all the pressure points like knees elbows and foot lubrication to eyes is also very much important this will prevent keratitis to the patient all the ecg leads have to be placed on back of the patient as it is shown in the picture place all the ecg leads on the back of the patient support blosters has to be placed as is shown in the picture you are placing we are placing pillows under the chest and also under the pelvis because of this what happens the abdominal pressure will be reduced and so patient will have comfort and ensure secured airway because when after ventilating after mechanical ventilation initiation you always prone the patient because of this there is a chance of the et tube to be misplaced so for this before you initiate proning sessions always you have to tape it and you have to withhold feeds for 45 minutes to 1 hour why is this uh, is that it is self explanatory that when you are proning the patient there is compression on the abdomen so that there, there may be regurgitation so you always have to withhold the feeds 45 to 1 minute prior to the proning secure all the tubes and catheters the easy thing is that what you have to do all the lines that are placed above to the waist level what are all the lines that patient is having above the waist level all the lines has to be placed at the head end of the patient as it is shown in the third picture all the lines are brought to be head end of the patient and all the lines that were present below the waist level of the patient that you have to place at the foot level so for this in this way you have to secure all the tubes and catheters and the other thing is for this proning position it always we always require 3 to 6 persons including the respiratory therapist and weight of the considering the weight of the patient always make sure you have 3 to 6 persons with you readiness or to emergency airway and resuscitation equipment should always keep with you because we do not know when disasters can happen so how to prone the patient it is uh, very much clearly evident in the pictures or shown in the pictures that before you prone the patient make sure patient is in the flat position and his arms are tucked and you have to place two pillows one over the chest and one over the pelvis over the pillows you also have to cover a bed sheet and once you have done this you have to tuck the bed sheet and hands into the sides of the patient after tucking them 
you have to slide the patient away from the ventilator as shown in the first image. Once you slide the patient away, you have to turn the patient 90 degrees. You have to turn the patient 90 degrees towards the ventilator and then turn the patient completely into the proning position. So when you prone the position, make sure that respiratory therapist is at the head end of the patient and he is guiding you as well as securing the ET tube. So once prone position is done, what is the nursing care that you would give to the patient is always make the patient stay in a swimmer's position. As shown in the picture, the hand should be placed on the sides of the face of the head of the patient and eyes should be taped. As I said you earlier, it will reduce the, uh, there is a chance of keratitis because of the dryness that is caused because of eye opening. So always tape the patient. Regular suctioning is very much important as we have discussed before because of this mobilization of secretions out and um, these secretions will be pulled in the mouth so always you have to do regular suctioning reverse tendler birth position should be offered to the patient this is because because of this elevated head regurgitation and gastric secretions pooling will be reduced you have to reduce over stretching of brachial plexus this over stretching of brachial plexus can be done by always placing hands on the sides of the head. If you do not place hands on the sides of the head and you uh, place them sides of the abdomen, the, there will be stretching of brachial plexus and there will be uh, nerve damage to the patient. For this reason, always place them on the side of the head. Then after the proning, you always have to assess whether the patient is able to tolerate the prone position or not. So, you also have special considerations for whom this uh, proning also can be offered not only with the mechanical ventilation, but it can also be done when patient is on ECMO. Bronchoscopy can be successfully done when patient is in the prone position, when uh, bronchoscope used is flexible. And CPR when patient is in the prone position and when patient had a cardiac arrest, do not um, look back. You always can start any uh, CPR when patient is in the prone position. So for that, this AED leads, you have to place on the one on the lateral side and one at the scapulary area. Keep your hands on near the scapula as shown in the picture and you can always initiate CPR with 30 to two respirations. Thank you. So any doubts anyone is having who have uh, participated in the session, kindly leave in the chat box. Thank you, Gayatri, for the crisp presentation on prone ventilation. And to dive deeper into the topic, let's uh, invite our uh, expert panelists for the day, our pro, uh, Dr. Vishwes sir, on the board. So can you just brief us about uh, why proning and when we have to start proning uh, in the critically ill patients? So proning is a, we call it as a rescue mode of ventilation. That means only when your conventional modes of ventilation have failed, then we will go to proning. So what we do is whenever a patient comes to us with ARDS, we first ventilate the patient. We optimize the ventilatory settings. And despite giving a, a adequate ventilation, which we call as a lung protective ventilation, if the FiO2 requirement is more than 60% and a patient PF ratio, we see the ABG, we look for the PaO2 by FiO2 ratio. If it is less than 150, then that is the point we consider uh, proning. But uh, since the advent of the COVID, even without a ventilator, we are seeing that few patients who are progressing to require a ventilator, we put them on uh, prone just with a, a HFN high flow nasal cannula or uh, even with a NIV. So now things are changing. We, that is what we refer to as um, awake proning. That is even without a patient being on ventilator also, we can prone such patients. Okay. What may be the uh, contraindications? Like we do have got uh, absolute contraindications uh, and uh, uh, the others. Like which can be the relative one? So the only absolute uh, contraindication for proning would be your any sort of spine instability. Like you have got a cervical fracture or any fracture in your spine, or you have got a pelvic fracture, then you will not prone such patients. 
Apart from that, there are few relative contraindications. Let's say that the patient is having a chest wall trauma where you feel like he cannot be prone, then you don't prone. Or patient is having severe hemodynamic instability. That is, he is requiring multiple vasopressors to maintain blood pressure. Then proning might turn risky for this patient because it will change your intrathoracic pressure and it can decrease your cardiac output. And patients who are pregnant, we generally try to avoid proning. And patients who are extremely obese, like BMI more than 50, it becomes a technical challenge to do proning in such patients. And even amongst patients who has got an intracranial uh, hypertension, like because of uh, they have undergone a uh, brain surgery or anything, in such patients also we tend to avoid proning. But these falls under the relative contraindications. The only absolute contraindication for any patient for proning would be like a spine instability. Then definitely it becomes a contraindication. Okay. So does this differ with the pediatric patients and the adults if we want to prefer with the prone ventilation? So what may be the uh, age group that we will we can do it in the pediatrics? See, I'm not a pediatrician, so I really have not had so much of experience with respect to the pediatric. But having said that, even for 10 year, 11 year, we have done pruning. So I don't know what is the age cutoff for saying that beyond which uh, pruning cannot be done. Maybe for a neonate, yes, we won't do because... Uh, there will be a risk of aspiration. I assume I have not done it, so I'm, I cannot, I'm not the right person to say that. Great. So what might be the hemodynamic effects that can be observed when the patient is on prone ventilation? So in prone ventilation, what really happens is now your intrathoracic pressure increases because from a supine, you are putting the patient on prone. So there are chances that immediately after proning, you may see a transient fall in the blood pressure. So when a patient is uh, being prone, so you may have to have adequate venous access. So, and uh, probably you may have to resuscitate them with adequate um, fluids or slightly there may be an increase in the requirement of the vasopressor also immediately following proning. But let's say that you are proning the patient and patient goes in for a profound hypotension or mm -hmm. patient is going into a worsening hemodynamic instability, then again, you may have to supine these patients because those are the patients who are not uh, the appropriate candidates for um, proning. Uh, in case if you want to talk about uh, who might be the uh, means, uh, to have a good team uh, to do the proning and uh, if in, in case if the patient is on ECMO and still we, uh, uh, you consider that we need to uh, shift the patient into the prone position. So what is the best team briefing that needs to be done? So you need to, to always, yeah, whenever you do a um, uh, patient, especially for a proning for a patient with an ECMO, you always require a perfusionist. He is the main person who is going to take care of all your lines, he's going to take care of your machine. He's going to make sure that there are no clots forming or there is no accidental leakage of the circuit. Yes. And second thing is, it is always wise to have a, at least a cardiothoracic vascular resident, if not for a consultant, while you are considering a proning for a uh, patient on an ECMO, because anytime there can be an accidental decanalation of uh, the circuits while proning, you need to have a dedicated intensivist who should be at the head end because he need to make sure that um, uh, he takes the lead in giving proper instructions to all the members who are involved in the proning process. And another thing is you need to have very skilled uh, sisters uh, to make sure that the lines are intact because most of the time people will be in a hurry to prone, but they forget to make sure the lines in which the, uh, the life sustaining vasopressors are going on are not proper. And you need a very good OT, uh, ICU technicians who provide the manpower for proning. So it's always a team effort. It, it is not like one person decides on uh, the proning. And in case of an ECMO, definitely a perfusionist and a standby CTVS uh, assistant, or if preferably a consultant, along with a trash card and um, uh, for equipments for replacement of the circuit is needed. Uh, thank you, sir. In case if we have got the uh, duration, like uh, which time we can relax the patient uh, from the uh, proning and when we can uh, place the patient in laterals or into the supine. So do we have so, any considered duration? Yeah. So generally, the, when the studies initially came, the PROSEVA trial, that was the first study which really showed the presence of um, improvement in uh, lung func uh, PF ratios upon proning. So they did a trial for 16 hours, like continuously they prone the patient for 16 hours and followed by that they supine the patient for four hours. Again, they did the proning, they did it like for three sessions. So we minimum required time would be like 16 hours for your um, uh, proning sessions. But people have continued proning, even extended proning have been tried. People have tried even for 24 hours and followed by that four hours, they place the patient on a supine position. Again, they put, put them on a prone uh, position. 
So general followed rule in most of the ICUs, 16 hours of proning followed by four hours of supine. Again, repeat the cycle at least for three cycles. But right these days, there are also data to suggest that extended proning can also be carried out. Like more than three days also, you can try uh, proning. Okay. What might be the effects of uh, uh, prone positioning on oxygenation for uh, if considered? So proning is generally done to improve the oxygenation because the concept by which the proning really works is like when you put a patient on a prone position, your heart, uh, the effect of the gravity effect of the heart on the lungs decreases and the heart moves forward. So the more amount of the lungs are now available for uh, oxygenation, that is one mechanism. What is the clinical so, second impact? Second mechanism is we call it as the ventilation perfusion. Yeah. Yeah. Clinical, clinic, in terms of what I didn't uh, get you, clinical impact in terms of in, uh, impact and outcome based on this uh, prone ventilation. Sir. Yeah. In, in terms of impact, yes, proning in appropriate patient. That means early proning. Once a lung has become totally fibrotic, even if you prone the patient, you will not see an improvement. So proning has to be done very early. And if done, it really improves the PF ratio. And there are many patients in whom we have considered an alternate option of ECMO, but upon proning, they have really improved. But uh, in few patients, um, uh, if the disease process is very rapid and the lung becomes non-recruitable, or if you are putting the patient on a prone in a delayed phase, let's say patient got referred to us after five, six days, whatever proning you do, the lungs don't recruit. So it depends upon at what time you are initiating the proning and what is the sort of ARDS you are dealing with. Uh, and in case if proning fails, yes, you have to go for ECMO. Great. In case if you want to give us a take-home message of best five points that you have to, as a nurse, the nurse needs to remember when uh, they are handling a prone positioned patient with ECMO or with any other uh, uh, areas, like how, what points can you give us? So first thing is, uh, it's always a team effort, uh, team effort. So you should believe in your team rather than thinking that you are the sole person for doing everything that doesn't work in proning. Second thing is always initiate proning early. Like it is not like you do it after five, six days. It is like the moment you feel that the PF ratios are not improving and patient is a candidate for proning, you have to prone the patient. And be very clear with your instructions when you give proning. The person who is at the head end should take the lead and all his instructions should be rehearsed before the proning session is actually taking place. He, you need to rehearse. You need to say to them, this is what, and you need to assign roles for the people who are involved in the proning process. So that makes your proning relatively easy and uh, chances of accidental um, uh, mishaps are uh, pretty less. And the fourth thing is always watch the monitor because when you are busy with your proning, many a times people are so engrossed in the proning process that they don't see the vitals at all. And after you do all this process, you realize that probably the patient has sustained an MI or sustained an arrhythmia. So somebody should take care of uh, monitoring the vitals of the patient. And the most important thing is during the process of proning, always make sure that you have adequate lines because once you prone the patient again, putting a line or putting, making sure that the patient is going to have an IV conduit is going to be very difficult. So you need to make sure these checklists are full, filled and rehearsed before you initiate the process of proning. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. We have to thank uh, our own uh, whole team, especially uh, Vishwesh sir for uh, making your time to uh, come out for this webinar and to talk about and to have a discussion and to have give on. us uh, great insights about the prone ventilation, even though it is very crisp. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you and I thank all my team, uh, especially the digital team and the whole nursing education department, especially for the speaker for the uh, for the day, Ms. Gayatri, for giving us a comprehensive insights on the, about the uh, prone ventilation. Thank you, everyone.